Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tahoe Silicon Mountain's Mountain Minds Monday event. Tonight's topic, van life, the good, the bad, the ugly of do-it-yourself. While we're going through the presentation, you can start accumulating questions either in the YouTube comments or by emailing megan at tahoesiliconmountain.com. That's M-E-G-A-N at tahoesiliconmountain.com. Tahoe Silicon Mountain puts on two monthly events, Mountain Minds Monday, which is our flagship event that has been the second Monday of the month for the last 10 years, and first Friday at four, an entrepreneur's roundtable, which is on hiatus during the uh, distancing during the pandemic. We also have two annual events that are awaiting our return to in-person programming. As I mentioned, Mountain Minds Monday is the second Monday of the month, and so stay tuned for the announcement of our topic for next month. You can stay informed by signing up for the email newsletter, joining our Facebook group, or subscribing to the YouTube channel. We do ask for the suggested donation of $5. If you go to tahosiliconmountain.com in the upper right is a donate button. Several reasons why we do ask for the donation is because we do operate as a fully volunteer 501c3 and we rely on your donations to make all of this happen. We have an all volunteer board and we're always looking for additional volunteers. So reach out if you'd like to get involved. Our longtime gold sponsor is Holland and Hart Law Firm. Our silver sponsor, also a law firm, is Mobo Law. And community partners, including Nevada County Tech Connection, Tahoe Truckee Media, the Truckee Tahoe Airport, the Lyft Workspace, where we're broadcasting today, the Truckee Chamber of Commerce, and Tahoe Donner, who hosts us when we're meeting in person. And you too can become a sponsor. I'd like to jump ahead to introducing our speaker tonight. Um, Nick Polinko is a mechanical engineer, the former CEO of Rumpel, an outdoor blanket brand, and the COO of Tahoe Modern, a staging and design firm based out of Truckee. Polinko's firsthand experience of his time on the road can be heard on the podcast, Wheel Travel Far, W-H-E-E-L, Wheel Travel Far, or seen on Instagram at The Long Cruise. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Nick. Thank you, Nick. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think we've had a little technical difficulties, but hopefully everything is working well now. Um, <clears throat> here we are in Truckee and in a pandemic. And so what better time to talk about van life? We've all been trapped in our houses too much and we need to get some fresh air and yet hotel rooms and road stops are still maybe a little bit too sketchy for us. So here to talk about what we can do about that. Again, my name is Nick Polinko. I started off once upon a time as a mechanical engineer. I founded a company that specialized in outdoor camping blankets. Uh, I currently run a company called Tahoe Modern with my partner where we do staging and design. But the thing you're probably the most interested in is our trip we did in 2017 and 2019, over 18 months, San Francisco to Patagonia and back to Buenos Aires. Um, I'd also like to introduce you to our van, which we have just mostly completed. Uh, his name is Lou Van. Um, this was actually our COVID project. Uh, something we always wanted to do when we came back from our trip was kind of upgrade. And now that we knew that we really wanted to incorporate this kind of lifestyle full time, uh, we decided to design a van from scratch. And here you can see some of our uh, work in progress stuff, um, kind of the composting toilet going in, the CAD that we used. And then this is the final product. Um, I think it came out pretty well. There's always some things that we're going to want to change and update and fix as we go. But overall, I think uh, we are pretty pleased with it. So there's my there's my credentials. So van dwelling is not new, but for some reason it's really popular now. And I think to understand why, you know, the hashtag van life is popular versus just, 
you know, RVs and motorhomes, we have to look at a couple different things that have happened over the last few years. Um, number one is the availability of cheap electronics uh, with Amazon, with uh, all these sites, you can get two day shipping on things that used to cost thousands of dollars and be very rare only for the uber wealthy. And now I think they're very uh, distributed over uh, a lower, uh, anyone with money can now buy this electronic equipment. Um, that's fridges, that's solar, that's batteries, all that stuff has come down in price significantly over the last few years. Uh, another reason is uh, a lot of uh, manufacturers are actually building four by four vans. And I'm speaking especially to the trucky people up here who, you know, have to encounter uh, mixed roads and, and definitely snow in the winter. Um, having something that comes straight from the factory built with four by four is actually now could, could start replacing your, your SUV as a reliable form of transportation. And the third is what we all like to love and blame social media. Uh, I would also say that we're guilty of this. We see a location, you know, someone posts a, of a lake and you're like, well, I didn't even know that lake was, you know, in this country, let alone 10 minutes from our house. And so we would kind of go find and explore these things. And so it's a really fun way to share things, but also, you know, these things are becoming more popular as people say, see what else is out there, which I think in the end is a good thing that people are out there and enjoying nature uh, as long as they are doing it responsibly. Uh, let's talk about some hashtag van facts. Uh, this presentation is specifically geared toward um, class B style van RVs. And what we can look at is in the, in the in the previous years leading up to this, we've seen 90% year over year growth in this category. And this year, even with COVID, uh, we had seen a 40% growth in sales uh, in, I think that was June, while all other sectors saw a 30 to 50% decline. So this was the only category that, de that increased uh, in terms of RV sales during COVID. Um, if you want to go and buy specific parts, or have kits made for you, there's waiting lists. Um, if you wanna have someone custom build you a van, you're looking at six to 12 months to at least get on their list. Um, when we look at the cost of these vans, um, I know that's one of those things everybody loves to ask is like, well, how, how much can I get into it for? Um, we're seeing new vans, that's a brand new van with stuff um, to build it out, starting at $65,000 and going up to 180,000. Um, I'll put a little asterisk in there is that this van life trend started with people buying old, crappy, used vans with high mileage and building them out and trying to make them look as pretty as possible, even though they were paying five or $10,000 for them. So that is not the rule. It is more of a, if you wanted to get something new and reliable and, some, and, and put parts in there that haven't been used before, you're looking at 65 to 180. Um, why is van life... Uh, going to continue being popular is we see this kind of younger tech-based economy, especially in California and Austin, Seattle area, that definitely were not as hit as hard as um, other industries. And a lot of these people are now working remote. So we're seeing people being leaving the cities, having mobile work offices and being able to, to live and work abroad. Um, and then the, the most interesting thing is that this, in this pandemic economy that we have, there's a huge shift towards localized travel. Uh, people are refusing to go to hotels. They don't want to get on a plane, um, but they still want to leave their house that they've been quarantined in for the last six months. So I think people are definitely looking at this style of travel and um, you know, size of vehicle as a really good op opportunity to have a summer vacation without putting a lot of risk for uh, the virus. Um, so this kind of uh, presentation is divided into two parts. One part is kind of a background into your options that are available out there. And then part two is the DIY version of it. Um, and I say that because it's really important to understand how and why you want to use a van before spending hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars building it. That seems very trivial, but you would not imagine how many people have went out, bought a $100,000 RV or van and realized like, oh no, 
this isn't going to work for me at all. And then you spent time and money to get a new one. And it, it was all because they didn't think through what their actual needs were. Um, when we talk about recreational vehicles or RVs, um, there's a bunch of different classes. Um, I'm highlighting three popular classes here, but there's many more. Um, the class A RV is your typical house on wheels. It's got bathrooms, beds, couches, full-size refrigerators. Uh, they are very comfortable. However, they traditionally use a lot of gas to move around, they are very heavy, they can be very expensive, and they generally need to be hooked into RV parks. So this is what you'd be call a park model. Um, they don't function very well if they don't hook up to a full electrical grid and have sewer systems to dump their waste, um, which is why people have kind of trended towards the class C's, which is a smaller version of that. It's easier to drive. Um, it doesn't require planning your route as much. Um, similar things with toilets and electrical, um, varying levels of uh, being able to be off grid or boondocking as they call it. Um, but, and again, the Class C's still are an RV. They would not be able to park at Safeway uh, in a normal parking spot. Um, so which is why we're here to talk about the Class B RVs. Um, these are built off of uh, a van chassis. Um, and I think the reason why a lot of these people are gravitating towards, you know, van life versus RV life versus um, whatever is because these can actually be driven daily. Um, we drive ours as a second car. It's great for running groceries. Uh, it's great for picking up plywood. Um, it actually is kind of more like a truck than it is a RV. So it is definitely with that reason why van life is popular. And I know when we talk about uh, activities, the having a van that can pull into a normal size trailhead parking lot and not have to require 14 people to be able to flip it around is actually really appealing um, to the people who want to use these to both for transport and for living. When we talk about uh, your options, you can really go two ways for doing a class B. Um, the first way is obviously your production RV. Historically, these were um, designed to be used in a park, as I mentioned before. And historically, the largest purchasers of RVs have been people in the 40, 50 and retired crowd and beyond. And it's only recently that you've been seeing RV makers start to change their uh, marketing and change their offerings to appeal to a lower crowd. Uh, this model to the right on your screen is the uh, Winnebago Rebel. It's one of the only off the lot four by four adventure RVs that you could buy. And I think this would be a very good representation of a, of a very high level build if you were to do it yourself. Um, but it does get you into that van life. It gets you four by four and it comes with you know, factory made production level, quality level uh, interiors, which is very appealing. Um, they are expensive. We should definitely note that when you, when you start getting into specialized and four wheel drive, the price goes up every time. But uh, for these, I've seen them going for 130 to $160,000 roughly, um, which is a little bit out of the range of the average buyer. Um, so then we're gonna talk about round two is making your own. Um, when you're making your own, you can either go to a custom upfitter, someone who specializes in making custom vans, or you can do it yourself. I think, um, as you'll see in this presentation, I think having a team of those people and doing some stuff yourself and a, having a, an up custom upfitter is a really good way to go. Um, the, the nice thing about going on your own is that you really get to decide what you want. You know, you're not letting some RV exec decide what kind of van you want. You really get to be uh, the maker of your own destiny. With uh, nomadic living, uh, the first question everybody likes to ask is, what do you do about going to the bathroom? Uh, I think this is a very hot topic and I think it's becoming 
even more um, of an issue as there's more and more people getting into this way of travel. Popular destinations are seeing a lot more people, which means you're seeing a lot more refuse. So I think when you're traveling remotely um, and if you plan to be mostly off grid and in the middle of nowhere or at national parks and campgrounds, um, I think having a the old trowel and TP uh, route is, is actually not a horrible solution. It saves a lot of issues on plumbing. It gets you on the road quicker um, and it simplifies things. Uh, we actually did not have a toilet for 18 months and we are still here to this day. So it is, it is definitely possible. Um, the other option is either a full-time bathroom or some sort of portable toilet system. These I think are becoming more popular. They work better than you might expect. Um, it, they don't have a porta potty kind of smell. They actually are a really good option. And um, there's people who put these in the back of their Subaru for when they're on road trips and they use them and they don't have a, have a smell or leak issue, which is um, promising. Um, well, like I said, when, as this is about, this talks about DIY, we really want to talk about what are you doing and why, why you want to customize a van. There are a ton of good vans, two wheel drive and four wheel drive out there right now that you can go and buy off the lot. They're done. All the switches work. There's a manufacturer's warranty. Um, they're ready to go. And I think for the, for some people that is a really good option, but for some people they're going to want to, they're going to want more. Um, one of those categories of people who are looking for uh, activity specific vehicles. So whether you're a skier or a surfer, um, you like to mountain bike or you need something that fits motorcycles, that is a, is a really good reason to customize your own vehicle. RVs are not specially designed to handle motorcycles. They're not specially designed to put surfboards and have a spot for your ski boots in. So thinking through that is, is if you're very activity driven with your travel, you only take vacations to go do the things you like to play, uh, customizing is a good thing to do. Um, another reason to customize is, uh, is, is trip spe specific travel. Uh, people who are doing long-term travel, they're, you're gonna have different requirements than someone who's gonna be doing something for a weekend or uh, a long week. So you would definitely want to customize the exact thing that you're going to want for living in for six months, a year and beyond. Um, if your trips take you off highway, like I said, there's not a lot of stock RVs that are off-road or off-highway rated. So creating a custom off-highway um, overland vehicle is definitely an appealing reason to customize. And then uh, the third is stealth camping. And this is kind of a category that's been pioneered by the van life, which is going to destinations or cities and being able to park without drawing a lot of attention to yourself. A lot of these vans also look like delivery vans. So if you're parking in an industrial area or if you are um, trying to go unnoticed, this is a good way to uh, kind of skirt not having a campground or a proper remote campsite. And then also there's the people. Um, if you're a single person who's who's now working remote, customizing your own RV to have your own a desk and the exact amenities that you need to live remote is a really good reason. Um, if you're a couple and one partner likes to kayak and the other partner likes to fish, then having a, a, a vehicle that can accommodate those different things is a really good reason to customize an RV. And of course, family, big or small, how many kids you need, what are the requirements of the family? Really good reasons. Right now we'll talk about part two of my speech, which is the DIY aspect of making a van. We call this the good, the bad, the ugly, based off of a, a blog that we had done on our trip where we always liked to talk about the good things, the bad things, and the ugly, ugly things that happened. And it did not ever mean that we had a bad trip or that we regret anything, but I think people really wanted to know, yeah, yeah, okay, we see these perfect things, but like really what's what's going on under the hood? So the purpose of this is to really show you both the good sides and the less talked about sides of this whole DIY thing. Um, the first van that we will talk about 
is what I'm calling the basic van. Um, this is gonna have key features. You're gonna wanna put a bed. You're gonna wanna finish the walls out so it doesn't look like a full delivery truck. Um, you'll have some basic organization and some basic lighting so you can see at night. Um, the reason why the basic van is very appealing, I think is because really anybody can do it. Um, this is something that it's a really good weekend project. This is um, a really good way to get out on the road and have shelter, be out of the wind, be out of the cold, bring your toys along. And it's, it's a really good way to, to sample this whole thing before going out and spending $180,000 on some tricked out brick. Um, a pro tip, uh, I'll be giving some tips for each van that we're kind of talking about here, is it's this type of stuff is like very basic plywood construction, uh, DIY, uh, with pretty much with anyone with a handsaw can make. So you can get creative. There's tons of resources online that show you how to make different types of, of, of furniture that allows you to basically just take an empty van, throw up some walls and drop a plywood, uh, mattress in there or plywood with a mattress on top and really just get, get going. Um, Another pro tip I would give is for this level, this is a really good place to buy a used van. Um, when you start doing modifications and start making a van that's you're spending more and more money on, you definitely want to make sure that the quality of the van represents the amount of money you're spending. Uh, we have really a lot of friends that we know that bought used vans, put a ton of hours and a ton of money into it. And then at the end of the day, they were still left with a van with 200,000 plus miles on it. And at some point that's just not gonna, not gonna keep, keep running. So um, these, these more basic versions, really good opportunity, buy something with high mileage, drive it for two years. And then once you've kind of gone through that cycle, you can now upgrade to a different van. Um, I have some water here. Uh, here we'll talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. The good about basic vans. You get shelter from the elements. They're cheap and easy to make, minimal experience required. And you can get the job quick and done. You can get the job done quick, which means you have more time to play. Uh, there's nothing worse than building, spending a year building out a van to go do the stuff you want to do. And you spend all the time building the van and not actually having fun. And then the other good thing about a basic van is the way that you would probably go about making it whenever you were done or needed to sell it or upgrade or whatever you wanted to do, you could literally spend an hour, remove everything and have a nice bonfire. So it's a really good option if you're just thinking about getting into this without spending a lot of money. The bad. You have entered a slippery, potentially endless slope of modifications. Um, I say this truthfully is that once you start down this pathway, you're going to be like, oh man, this is great. I wish I just had water. And then you have water I'm like, well, I have water. I'd like to cook. You want to cook? Well, I want to cook a bigger meal and I want to, it just keeps going and going and going. So be aware of that when you go the basic van route that it will probably be more than you were ready to, uh, more than you planned. And the ugly, um, Number one reason why basic vans are tough to live in is that they don't have shelves, they don't have organizational stuff and it can be a complete mess and you kind of end up sifting through your stuff to try to, to live and function. And um, that might be fine for two days or a week, but at some point you need to know where everything goes and everything needs to have a place. Organization is the key to long-term happiness on the road as my partner would always say. Uh, number two reason is that uh, with basic vans, you definitely have sanitation issues. So like we said, you get campgrounds where a lot of people are driving to because they have a really good view of the valley. And then you have now people all deciding to go number one and number two in this, this parking spot. It can get overloaded quickly. So thinking about sanitation and the growing network of vans is definitely a consideration. As we go into the next 
level, which I'm calling the adventure van, uh, we're gonna add a couple key features. Uh, we're gonna add cabinets, we're gonna add water, uh, we're gonna add a basic AC-DC power system, and we're probably gonna add an electric cooler that hooks up and runs off of a uh, battery system. Um, the reason I call this level an adventure van is that it doesn't make any um, misrepresentations that it's something that it's not. It's very function first and then looks second. So this is gonna be like, I need a place for my bikes. I need my skis to go somewhere. I'm gonna have boots and I wanna be able to have a cold beer at the end of the day. It's very function driven. Um, you, need, you, know, you need a place for your bed. You need to have a place for, for all your gear. And you start coming into these systems like, well, if, if we're gonna have a bed, we'd best have some reading lights by the bed. Uh, it would be nice if we could not turn the car on for three days and run the fridge without having to recharge the batteries. So you start, you, you start adding one simple thing, such as let's put a cooler in there. That cooler means you now have to have, to have a battery bank. And if you have a battery bank, you have to have a way to charge it. So maybe you're adding a small solar system. Um, so the, again, that is a slippery slope that I was kind of uh, mentioning. But the adventure van is really a specific I want something to get me from point A to point B and I want to show up, but I don't want to pitch a tent. I don't want to have to worry about reservations or hotel. And I just want to go to this destination and I want to surf or I want to bike um, or I just want to be in the middle of nowhere. Pro tips for adventure vans. Um, there are companies that are started, started to make custom I would almost call them Lego-like pieces that can go in your van uh, that might have a complete stove top, uh, running water system, um, and some shelving. And these are things, units that you could literally just buy and plop into your shell of a van with very little installation help. Um, this is a really good way to start getting quality components and things are gonna work. They're not gonna fail on you and um, really get off in living in the proper uh, van life scenario. Uh, second tip is um, electrical is hard. Uh, the amount of systems that you can put into a van are growing by the day and the complexity is growing and it can be very overwhelming to even just run a basic fridge or have a little bit of reading light at night. Uh, there are companies out there such as this one from Gold Zero that has a battery, it has an inverter, and it has solar charger all built into one. So you would literally just plug a solar panel into it, plug your computer on the other end, and plug your fridge in, and it would run your whole system pretty seamlessly. Um, also, a nice thing about this is that it's it's a standalone unit. You can take it out and sell it or move it to your campsite, or you can do other stuff with it. So. It's a really good way to have uh, a very nice uh, minimal amenities with very minimal work. The good of the adventure vans um, is that they're self-contained. You can now hop in your van on a Friday night, travel to your sleepy, get out or pull over, sleep, wake up, and then you're at the trail the next morning. Um, these are the most amazing road trip vehicles. As you're cruising down the road, you're thirsty, your partner can go back and grab you something from the fridge. Um, you have, you, you go to a rest stop, you don't have to go get greasy hamburgers, you have you know, the food that you brought from home. And it really changes what a long distance drive looks like and makes it really, really enjoyable. And then coming with Adventure Man, you're also having this organization and the organization will make you happy on the road. The bad, once you get into the zone, you start making permanent modifications. You're going to punch holes in for fans. You're gonna to wanna to put extra windows in. Um, you're gonna to want to do things that aren't necessarily ever gonna be able to, uh, no one who's not looking for a van will ever really want a, a van with a bunch of holes punched in it for stuff that they don't need. So you need to consider the fact that you're making these permanent modifications and what the future resale value and who's, who is now the market for this if you decide to sell. Um, with the adventure van, I think adventures usually have 
are bracketed in some sort of time frame. Um, I would not say that they are extremely sustainable on the long term. Um, you really want something that's going to be warm in the winter. You're going to want privacy. You're going to want real showers. So this adventure van style, generally you're, you're kind of living outdoors. You might have a stove or some water or a cooktop inside, but really you're, you're going to be doing most of your living outside because at this level of van, you haven't really invested time in building furniture. You haven't um, done a lot of cabinetry in terms of like, you know, making a kitchen and stuff like that. So um, it's something to think about for long-term living or long trip, long trips. Um, and then the bad part about adventure vans is they're often unrefined. Uh, with DIY comes matching that with your skills. You know, to get a RV level finish uh, is very hard. And vans have all sorts of crazy curves and angles and gaps and weird things that they're not just a blank slate. So accommodating all those takes a lot of planning and a lot of time. So if, you, if you're going the adventure run route because you don't have a lot of time and you because maybe you're not a full craftsman, be prepared that the interior is often a little rough around the edges and that's fine, but that's one of the downsides to, to going only halfway. The ugly, uh, you can spend a lot of money getting an adventure van and it might have mixed results. Uh, money spent does not always equal quality. Uh, if you'll browse used vans, you'll see RV or uh, customized vans that people have put you know, $50,000 into that they're selling for $70,000 with the van. So it's, you're really seeing that if the van is not done right, you're not gonna pay for someone else's botched work. So no matter how many cool gadgets and gizmos you have, if the wires are sparking, it's not gonna be very helpful for resale value. And then again, like I said, it's really easy to make things look bad. Uh, and this is really where it starts standing out if, of mistakes and mismeasurements and un, you know, boards that were cut wrong you know, you could look at an entire van and see the one, um, the one thing that's messed up usually first before you see the rest of it. So it's something to think about as you start putting this investment in. And then the top of the line, what I'm calling the tiny home van. Um, these are the ones that are being uh, perpetuated in the in the social media as people living these little micro apartments, sometimes even bigger than their apartments in the cities. And they are really an expression of the people living inside of them and people who want to, to travel, but also want to feel at home. Uh, with a tiny home, you're going to add in a uh, high uh, volume dedicated battery. Uh, it's definitely going to be self-charging solar power, giving you off-grid uh, capabilities. Um, you're going to think about what it's like to live inside the van. Um, if it's a rainy day, if it's snowing, you know, you're going to want to build out a couch and seating areas that aren't just on your bed. You're going to want to be able to be comfortable and be able to live inside and feel like maybe you're even at a hotel. Um, another increased expense is a heating of, of, of air heating system and a water heating system. Um, even the installation of these systems can be, you know, take someone eight to 16 hours uh, just to install and at $100 an hour can be a fairly pricey addition just to get something as seemingly simple as, as heating air. Um, the, uh, the final thing is obviously you're going to start having real appliances, a fridge, a real cooktop, um, gas burners or induction burners are, are popular as well. And this is really where you could actually call this a home. Um, it's going to have all the things you need to live indefinitely and live comfortably. Um, and when you get a van that looks as good as, as these vans here, it really does feel like you can just shut the doors and shut the world out. You can be in downtown Los Angeles and you have calm music on inside. You have your, your succulents and your uh, subway tile and everything just feels normal and uh, good. Some pro tips for building a tiny home van. Hire a professional. 
Um, there's a lot of people out there who are better at doing this than you are. Uh, you don't have to hire a professional to do it from beginning to end, but hire a professional to do the stuff that you are not comfortable doing. Um, even if you're comfortable doing it, you might want to put your time into doing something more enjoyable and not uh, fussing over uh, electrical systems and whether or not your uh, batteries are hooked up correctly. And then, you know, as you're going into this tiny home route, it's really important to have a mock-up of your van before you get going, whether you do this in CAD, uh, whether you do this like this guy did where he drew a bunch of pictures. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people I'm actually seeing are doing cardboard. They're literally just make cardboard where they're like, this is where our seat's going to go. This is where the bed's going to go. And they cardboard cut out and then they, <clears throat> them and their partners come in and pretend to live in it for a minute. And they're like, oh, wow, if we have the stove here, it's going to be really hard to get at this thing over here. So maybe we should flip this and, uh, rearrange. So thinking through all of your design aspects ahead of time and actually getting a little practice run through is really important and can save you a lot of money down the road when you realize your drawer won't open because it's bumping into your shower. The good of tiny homes. Like I mentioned, it's long-term living in these are easy, comfortable, and sustainable. Um, we, I would see no problem getting in our van today and going for four months and having no problem with space or uh, any, anything that I would ever feel homesick about because we've built one that is very much everything that we need, nothing we don't. Uh, one other uh, consideration is this kind of indoor lounge or entertaining. Um, Vans are fun, but the thing about vans is you oftentimes meet people and it's fun to entertain. And having a space inside your van as like a little living room to have people come in when it gets cold or snowy or raining out is actually a really nice way to entertain while you're on the road and have little dinner parties. Although COVID might say differently right now. Um, some of the things that are good is you start having these high, um, high quality, uh, accessories such as water treatment and uh, high-end solar systems that literally allow you to throw a hose in the in the water and have treated water. You have endless amount of power as long as you're having sun and you could in theory stay off grid without anything for weeks at a time until you ran out of food. And then there's those little touches with the tiny home, the tile countertops, the backsplashes, um, art even, those are the little things that make living in a van feel like you're not living in a van. It makes it feel like you're home. And when you shut the door again, and you, you're, you're actually going home. The bad. Uh, one thing to really think about is overweighting. A lot of people have these grand plans of having all these toys and everything in their van, and their van is not rated to carry the stuff that they want to put in there, including people, including gear, including toys, water, gas. Um, so there's definitely something to think about as you're doing this. Um, and it can be uh, an issue if you get into a wreck. It's not uncommon for claims adjusters to want to weigh the wrecked vehicle to see if you were overweighted. And if you were overweighted, it could actually be considered your fault because you were driving an improperly uh, non roadworthy vehicle. Um, the, again, we're talking about the investment on, on building a van. This is where your investment is really going to be done on quality. Um, this is where having a, a builder, uh, who's got a lot of experience, make a van for you. You're going to get the money out again because people know that they know how to make a very good van or you definitely, sorry, <laughs> someone's talking to me over here. Um, but yeah, definitely thinking about your investment here, investing in things that are, be, that are going to be high quality, that are going to last and not just uh, blow up on you. And then one bad thing about the tiny home that we must point out is that more living space, entertaining space, cooking space often means less toy space. So you might have to carefully think about how many surfboards you need, how many bikes you really are trying to bring, you know, what are your requirements that your trips are going to bring you on. Now the bad. 
they're expensive. You can easily spend 80 to 100K on a van yourself. And if you have someone build that same van for you with those same parts, it could be 30, 130, 150 and beyond. And it just gets crazier after that. So it's definitely something to think about. Not everybody can afford a perfectly constructed, uh, beautiful home on wheels. Um, and not everyone needs that. So it's, it's definitely a, a goal, not a need. Um, building a tiny home is, I would say, for the most adventurous DIYers only. You will be asked to do things that you never thought that you would be doing. You'll be sawing holes in the side of your van. You'll be drilling. You'll be cutting. You'll be doing all sorts of stuff uh, that, you know, a week before you had never needed to know about plumbing and or DC uh, charging systems. So if you're, if you're willing to learn and you're willing to uh, spend some time on YouTube and, and reading a lot of the various blogs. It's, it's definitely possible, but uh, it's going to be slower. And by slower, I mean, you're going to be going at van speed. Uh, van speed is kind of an inside joke with uh, the people I know who, who build vans in that everything you think is going to take an hour takes three hours. If you think it's, the van is going to take a month to build, it's going to take four months to build. So Mostly that's due to the fact that vans are kind of this weird amorphous blob, nothing matches up, measurements are off, construction is hard, it needs to be very precise, and it's something to be aware about in both planning. You know, if, you're, if you have a trip that you're planning for in a month and you have a month to build a van, you should plan to leave at least two or three months after you're planning to do that. Um, and if you ever want to make friends with someone who has built a van, ask them about van speed. Um, like I said, DIYing is not necessarily doing it all yourself. You can do the parts that you're comfortable doing. You can build a bed, you can put in the walls, you can build the floor. Uh, if you are comfortable with electronics, you can even do that. But um, I've included here some local resources um, that I used and who I think are top of their game for helping out people along the different along the stages. Uh, Catapult, which is a Jamie Campbell based a Truckee resident, but his shop is in Reno. He builds really nice, very clean looking vans. Uh, a really good friend, KP at six gun 12 volt is a 12 volt uh, van genie. And he, he's great at installing all that stuff. So I didn't really want to build it, put a heater in mine. I did not like the idea of tapping into my gas tank. I didn't like the idea of, of all the work that came along with that. So we hired him to do that for us. And it saved me a lot of headache and yelling and screaming. Uh, another local company, Havelock Wool, that sells uh, insulation. Um, they uh, specialize in uh, sheep wool insulation. So it's a great option and something you can drive down the street and just go pick it up. And it's a really easy uh, connection to have. And then there's another local trucky company that I think is very interesting called Trail Kitchens. And they make these drop-in modules that are both permanent and modules that you can actually lift out place on the ground and have a, have a kitchen outside if you want. So many more where they came from, but these are my four favorite in the uh, Reno Tahoe area. Um, that is it for the presentation portion. Uh, hopefully we'll see more and more of you guys out there and uh, I will open it up to questions now, if anyone's got questions out there. Hi guys, it's Megan. Um, I've been streaming it through your questions. Um, and we'll start with um, how large of a solar system for a van with a fridge light, you know, be able to charge your phone and laptop do you need? So I think the, for a small fridge and it's minimal uh, power, you only need hundred Watts. Uh, we had a hundred watt panel on our trip. And as long as we drove occasionally and didn't try to use our blender too much, uh, we had no problem, but you know, you start building in safety margins after that. So 200 amp hours makes you think that, okay, maybe we never don't really have to think about power. 300 means you never think about power. It's always battery and you can live a normal life and not have to worry about if your fridge is on or off. There were some issues with a curling iron a couple of times. So I just want to point that out. Um, one of my favorite questions is what is the importance of investing in four by four? The importance <laughs> of investing in four by four. This, I think to me is a, is a, 
definitely an argument or a discussion that me and my partner a discussion <laughs> have had over the years. How much do you really need four by four? On one hand, you have a really big, heavy, long, low clearance thing that was never really made to want to go off road. And on the other hand, you have an ability to go off road. So with a heavy, with an, with putting your entire life into a van and then taking that van and just shaking it back and forth violently as you're doing like a technical trail, uh, it's going to hurt their stuff inside the van. It's going to hurt the van itself. And, you know, it's not uncommon to see people who've actually tweaked their, um, their chassis because they were overloaded and tuning to do too much stuff too fast. On the pro side of four by four is that with a little bit more clearance and the availability of more traction, you can actually get off highway with confidence. Uh, you can turn around in a grass field and not have to worry about, you know, getting stuck. You can go over that small bump in the road or Creek without having to worry about uh, drop dragging the, the back of your RV or, or van on there. So there's definitely a good reason to, I would just make sure you know your reasons why. I think having living in Truckee for those Truckee residents out there, having four by four just means that you can take it to the ski area and you can go skiing all day and come back and cook lunch. Um, and not have to put chains on. Yeah. And so, yeah, <laughs> you're obviously avoiding chains and you know, it's, it's a, it's a convenience and I think it'll be more, it's more useful for people in different areas, but I would not recommend building out one of these types of vans to do four by four off-road rock crawling. You're just, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle and you'll never get anywhere close to like a stock, forerunner we'll, we'll, we'll ever get to so the only thing i would add there is also four by four holds value i think a little bit better than non four by four yeah if you look at um vans made by quigley uh printer four by four resale value the four by fours are way more popular than their counterparts so even if you have a a so-so build in yours if you go to resell it four by four people are willing to look past the so-so build and go towards the four by four um, how do you know where to park your van once you have it? Are they allowed anywhere? This is becoming a touchier and touchier subject. As you mentioned, more and more people are doing this and everybody wants that ideal van parked on the edge of the cliff, looking over everything. Um, the reality of it is, is that it's not going to be like that every night. Sometimes it's going to be behind a McDonald's. Sometimes it's going to be at a Walmart parking lot. Um, so keeping that in mind, it's always good to have, um, to be courteous. You know, if you were the person that you were parking in front of your house, if you're parking in a neighborhood, would that person would, and you live there, would, would you want someone sleeping in a van in front of your home? Um, would you want them showering? Would you want them walking their dog in front of your home? Things to consider, uh, before you, you park. Um, there's a lot of good resources, uh, with, with apps out there. iOverlander is an app that we used religiously on our trip. Um, and it's a crowdsourced uh, way that people would drop pins and be like, hey, there's this nice turnaround in a forest with a creek by it, great place to park, no traffic, you know. And so it's kind of, you're, at, you're seeing what people have found before you to drop those pins and suggest locations to go to. Um, what was your biggest lesson from building your own van? Biggest lesson from building my own van. Um, so as the cocky mechanical engineer, I thought that everything I designed would be made exactly to, uh, to spec. Um, as the novice intermediate carpenter, I realized that saw blade widths come into, come into account. Um, grains, chipping, uh, just the amount of measurements getting confused. So I was overwhelmed with the process of the cabinetry making. Um, I feel like I did a pretty good job, but I look at it and I'm like, oh man, that's off. And I really wish I would have done that better. So the uh, don't underestimate building cabinetry. Um, it's really tough and better left to someone who has a uh, professional or even high level woodworking experience if you're going for that look, which my partner was. I'm his partner, just for the record. Um, this is a big question to unpack, so maybe at the high level, but what would you say is like the good, bad, ugly of Dodge Promaster, first Mercedes, first uh, Ford Transit? Oh, okay. 
Uh, the Pro Master is cheaper and it's wider, so you can sleep sideways in it um, without bump outs. Without bump outs, it's they're made to be local delivery vans. They're not actually made to be an international vehicle, um, so they're just made a little bit cheaper. But that comes with the price. Um, the Sprinter is a Mercedes. It's German engineered. It's diesel. It's strong. It's well made, well designed. Um, I like the cab of the Sprinter. Um, the forward cab has, is very spacious. Spacious. There's lots of room to move around, and then when you spin the seats, it's easy to spin the seats around, and you can turn into the back. So I like Mercedes for the front part of it. Um, but we bought a Ford and the reason that we bought a Ford is it kind of falls in the middle price range. It's a domestic van. So it's going to be not as much as an imported or a European brand, not as much as a Dodge. Um, parts are widely available uh, with Mercedes. There's not a Mercedes dealership everywhere you go, but there's definitely a Ford dealership everywhere you go in the States. And that was important to us. And we didn't want to have to be stuck trying to find a specialized mechanic when we know that anybody with uh, with a wrench can fix a Ford. So that's, I would say the, the highest level and price point is definitely something is a, is a big consideration there. Sure. Um, this is particularly important as we're heading into colder months. What do you recommend for winterizing in your van? For winterizing, um, does, there's two different types of winterizing, whether you're gonna live in it or whether you're gonna store it. I think they're probably talking about living in it. Um, it's, uh, you know, going again, insulating your walls properly. So you're, you're able to like hold your heat in. Um, that also helps with sound on the road. So you can put the Havelock wool or you can put Primaloff insulation in on the, on the walls and then uh, put plywood up and you can kind of retain your heat. Um, for heating, again, there's very expensive built-in routes, our van has a, has a heater that pulls gas, gasoline off of our gas tank. So as long as we have gas in the tank, we have uh, heat for our van um, and it's very efficient. Um, but there's also heater buddies, which are designed for ice fishing sheds. And you can hook those up to a little propane bottle and those will heat you um, when you need to. Obviously one is more out of the way. One is like on your floor and can get knocked over or you throw a puppy on it and it could potentially burn. So definitely issues that arise with, with heating. But um, my biggest recommend, recommendation for winter camping is making sure you don't have anything that can freeze. If your bathroom lines freeze or if your plumbing or anything that can crack your pipes and then now you have a beautiful van that's leaking water or you can't flush a toilet because it's now frozen pieceicles. <laughs> Uh, let's do one more question. I know we started late, so uh, we're ending a little late, but um, uh, in a basic level kind of adventure van, what is the best plan for taking a shower? The best plan for a shower, in my opinion, is to not have a shower inside. Um, there are people that make outdoor shower curtains that unfold and give you an instant shower room. Uh, shout out to Zero Declination there. Um, those are really easy. You just bolt them on and you have privacy and you're in your shower. Um, the other thing is having um, a module for hot water and you can buy these on Amazon. They're hundred dollars. They basically just plug into any water source. If you have a, a water jug or uh, you know, a, a square uh, water tank in your van, you plug this up to that. It turns it on and you can draw hot water. Why don't you recommend having a shower inside? Moving a shower inside is always, every time you turn the shower on, there's always a chance for that water to stay in your van and not be properly removed. So if you're gonna have a shower indoors, you need to make quadruple, quintuple check that you're not gonna be having leaks. Cause as soon as you have a leak, you might not even know about it. That leak could then start seeping around your entire van. And then in a year or two, you have a complete molded out van, which is very, um, would require basically ripping out everything from, from scratch. So putting a shower inside is definitely something I think should only be left for the pros, but having, uh, you know, opening the doors, the back and having a shower curtain gives you 99% of the privacy you would need and you can go surfing and come back and get fully 
nude and take a nice little warm shower and it's great. And then you just leave your, your puddle or you have a little uh, grate that you stand on a, a teak standing platform so you can stay out of the mud or the, the sand. And it's actually a really good method. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much for your time and the presentation. And thank you for everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, we would like to remind you that Mountain Mind Mondays happens the second Monday of every month. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you.